Good morning, everyone. My name is Becca Peel. I am really excited to talk with you today about the Navajo Evangelical Lutheran Mission. Um, for everyone who is in the Fellowship Hall, I hope you are enjoying some fry bread brought to you by Sherry Grindelin and Joan Tweeten. Uh, thank you, Kitchen Squad over there, uh, helping us illustrate some of the great things um, about the Navajo Nation and their culture. Um, for everyone who else who's online, I'm sorry, but you can just imagine the delicious fried nonsense that's happening. And hopefully you are partaking in some delightful treat at home. Um, before we get started today, I just want to acknowledge that we we at St. Andrew's Lutheran Church acknowledge that in this space that we are on the traditional land of the Duwamish and Coast Salish, Coast Salish people, a people that are still here continuing to honor and bring to light their ancestral heritage. And I've got cool slide power. Too much power. Um, so the goal for today is to talk to you a little bit about the Navajo Nation history, just to give you a background of what's happening in Arizona. Then we're gonna share some information about the campus, the Navajo Evangelical Lutheran Mission Campus. Um, a history of our outreach from our congregation and fellow congregations that we've inspired in the area, and then introduce you to our next project, as well as share a little bit about the trip that we are planning in partnership with Magnolia Lutheran um, Church. So I just want to again, special thanks to individuals that um, help bring this together today, Sherry Grindelin, Joan Tweeden, Jean Wallstrom, and my pal, Lyle Morris, uh, here from Magnolia Lutheran Church. And not here today is Michelle Vossler, who was present um, at our past trip. Um, and she's also very uh, excited to partake in our next uh, adventure. Boom. So the Navajo Nation um, extends in the states of Utah, Arizona, and New Mexico, covering over 27,000 square miles. Um, it is the largest rec recognized uh, in Native American uh, culture in the United States. Um, it was established, a tribal government was established in 1923 um, to help meet the increasing desires of the American oil industry. Um, and it was advantageous for the Navajo Nation to make sure that they had a council to represent their interests um, and to make sure that they had a voice in how their land was being utilized since that was denied them for a very long time. Um, so the Navajo Nation Council Chambers hosts 88 council delegates representing 110 Navajo Nation chapters. And so some of the terms that we might hear if you are visiting the Navajo Nation, uh, for Navajo people, the word is Dine, um, just to describe the group. And Jean, help me if I mispronounce it, but Navajo land is BKA. Did I say it right? Jean says good enough. You can always listen to the sounds uh, online as try to do it from better at from home. Um, but again, the land that they have uh, in these areas, it's um, extensive, but it also is remote and it's at just the resources that are available to the people. Um, and in their culture, they have utilized various means to make sure that they thrive and are able to support their families. Um, but it's still a difficult because of the terrain as well as um, the geography. So. so next, I just wanna provide a little bit about the timeline for the Navajo Nation for their culture. Um, just to give some perspective to the evolution of where they are now. Um, so it was in 1100 and 1500 AD where the culture emerged. Um, there's roots of the um, community outreach from the people from different Native American tribes that existed in that land. Um, so they believed to be born to the earth centuries earlier um, from the Four Corners areas of Colorado Plateau. Um, there, oh gosh, I'm trying to remember the tribe that's also starts with P, Jean. 
Thank you. Um, they also have share a lot of common ancestry with the Pueblo people that are in that area as well. It was in 1581, 1583, where they have first contact with the Spanish um, colonizers. In 1805, uh, there was a massacre at Canyon de Chele, which is a um, for not only for the Navajo people, also for the Pueblo people, um, a very powerful area in terms of its spiritual history. Um, and they massacred 100 Navajo women, children, and elders. Um, just to, and this is just one act of um, some of the uh, terror that has happened towards the people of the Navajo Nation. Um, in 1863, you had the Scorched Earth Campaign um, conducted by Kit Carson against the Navajo. So captives were forced to march on the Long Walk to Fort Sumner, or at 350 miles east of New Mexico, and many died during that campaign. One group led by Hoskinuni fled from the Monument Valley, and Kit Carson in pursuit um, was... Nate, Nate, they had a um, point named um, after that incident just because of the um, strive to escape this march. Um, and there was some important rock formations out of the march where they um, have named after the spiritual heritage in that region. Uh, in 1868, we have the creation of the Navajo reservation. So once they had forced everyone to move from different locations, then the treaty um, decided they would be able to provide some land for the Navajo people. So this is a picture of Spider Rock in Canyon de Chile. It's actually was taken by Michelle Vossler when we visited um, a couple years ago. And in the valley itself, there are tribes of people um, herding. You could, we saw herds of sheep at different points, little pinpricks, um, but the rock formations are um, incredible to see in person. And they are um, amazing for the culture and heritage as well. Um, also exciting in the canyon is you would see the, um, Pueblo people's homes that they carved from in the rock. As they're not pictured in this um, spot, you would have to turn a little bit from where we this outpost was. Uh, you would see some of the carved homes that they had. So really incredible archaeological ex experience. Thank you. Sorry, forgot <laughs> where to point. So we have now um, the reservation land was established. The reservations were still um, known to be areas where you can discriminate and alienate the people. Um, so in the Navajo Nation uh, was a growing culture, a growing population. And so they were able to create a tribal council so the Navajo communities were organized into different chapters to try to unify their voice and make sure that um, they could speak together to talk to the U.S. government. Um, it was President Roosevelt who appointed a commissioner of Indian affairs in 1933 um, who advocated a system of livestock reduction to alleviate soil erosion problems. And this was difficult for the Navajo people because um, it curbed their own abilities to support their families. And so that's why they really wanted to have a unified voice so that they can talk to the government in different ways. Um, what's also incredible is just the impact that the Navajo Nation had in supporting our own um, military efforts. Uh, the Navajo language is incredible. And if we ever, ever get a chance to play, listen, I hope you do. Because um, in that language, they utilize their own code system um, to help our military efforts in World War II. And they also were able to um, do some different that's weird one for code breaking for um, the Japanese. 
So Navajo Marines use their language for the battlefield code, which the enemy was unable to decipher. And there's some pretty cool um, monuments to and testaments of their efforts close to uh, Little Rock where we were. In 1968, the Navajo Tribal Council declares the reservation the Navajo Nation. And so that's now the people together are recognized as their own um, independent uh, location, and they have a Navajo flag as well. It's big strides. This is a picture of the Navajo Tribal Council. Um, so they have, again, those 88 different chapters that would come and meet and talk through the different areas um, interest and what support they need. So I just want to emphasize the community aspect of the Navajo people. Um, it's very family oriented. And so almost every act of their life, there is looking at ways that they can support each other. Um, so the Hogan is a um, communal building that's utilized to make sure that you have access to all areas of um, the elements because it's a eight side building with a fire pit in the middle. So you got a chance to really commune together. Um, planting of the crops as well. We're all celebrating nature, um, creation of different songs and prayers together that that's oral history. Um, so, but in addition to that oral history, that root together in sharing your culture, we have to recognize that they are in a difficult location. Um, again, that lack of resources, um, there's an incredible uh, way that like they build their land to get they build their homes together. They stay together in the different family units. Um, and then they're still not having the access to power water that others have in uh, the area and other states. Um, so the Navajo Nation estimates that of its 357,000 residents, up to 35% don't have running water. And so out of the pandemic, the Navajo Nation um, was hit really hard right from the beginning because of um, the lack of running water and the ability to uh, clean and make sure that they weren't spreading disease. Just something to be mindful of. But there is lots of amazing things that happen in the Navajo Nation outside of their own amazing culture. And one of those great things is the Navajo Evangelical Lutheran Mission. Um, they established uh, from Lutheran Church missionaries who wanted to lease five acres of land just to have a goal to start a medical center, a mechanic shop, and a radio station, a Christian boarding school just uh, to be a part of the area because they recognized um, the dip, that it is very widespread and there wasn't a lot of access to different resources. Um, so the very first building on this land was a combined church clinic in two apartments that began in 1954. So today the mission campus includes a um, K through second private Christian school, a clinic, as well as a home health care mobile service. Um, and the ELCA has a house of prayer, um, the church that is there. It provides um, different community meals as well um, as support. So at the mission, the Navajo people learn to see themselves and the church as the guiding light, but not the whole ship. So they are working to share the Christian values, but they are not trying to minimize um, the Navajo Nation, and they want to make sure that they respect the cultural values that are instilled. What was um, incredible from talking with Pastor Kate, who is at the campus now, um, she, her goal in life, even though she is a representative of the ELCA, is to make sure that it is the people, the Navajo people, who are guiding and leading different work ethics. Uh, perhaps just to add to that, Becca, uh, they are currently in a project with uh, PLTS, which is a seminary in the Bay Area, with to do a theological education by extension. They have two of their own people 
One is um, Yahtzee, uh, uh, Patterson Yahtzee, the director, plus a woman named Pat, Patty, and they are being uh, prepared and trained to take over the pastoral leadership for House of Prayer Lutheran Church. Um, it, they are, this is an exciting program. We heard more about it when we were just there. And so they have professors come from uh, the Bay Area, from uh, Oakland, uh, Berkeley area, uh, and they come out to the Navajo because there is no Navajo that they could, that would be free enough to, to actually leave their home, leave their <laughs> their digs, and go to San Francisco for three, four weeks at a time. So a professor comes there, and they house them in one of the apartments, and then um, they are being trained. They did have three, now, they, but they have two. One, uh, because of illness, could not continue with the training program, but this is really exciting for uh, us and also especially for Kate, uh, the leadership there is to get um, a uh, indigenous person taking over the pastoral care. And, more food and uh, well, and then the, the she said about the K through two, they will be starting the third year next year. They uh, one of the things Marvin and I did when we were there was to tear down a wall to make a class, two small classrooms into one big one so they can follow the distance, social distancing uh, guidelines as well as being able then to have a complete third year program. So um, they, they were larger, they did have some five and six, and then with the pandemic, blew all that pattern all to pieces. So they've had to start all over again with grades uh, preschool, grades one and two. And now next year they will expand to a full for, uh, grade three. And then they, do, they, do, they will keep building a new building, uh, actually new classrooms, in order to uh, accommodate the growth in the program. And there's plenty of kids, uh, you know, that want to be there. So, yes. As, so this uh, picture in the lower corner is of the church. And then in the upper corner, um, you see the school and the office. But, you know, we are not new timers to this location, as Jean just mentioned. She was just down there. Um, so we have a history of mission and outreach in the area. It was just two years ago. Yeah, January, um, no, March of 2020. Yep. It was the year of lockdown, right before we right locked before. down. <laughs> we uh, spent a week down there. So I, where there was nine different um, guests who were down in that area to help support the renovation. 13. Of, there were 13 of us. 13, my goodness. I can keep track. <laughs> 13 of us helping the renovation of an 88 bathroom um, to make sure that they can open up to more individuals as guests. Uh, we also supported some classroom renovation and cleanup um, just because it was spring break at that time. Uh, we supported their community meal program as well as um, cleaning up some of their library. Now, Jean has just come back from a trip from that area um, just to share more about what has been happening down there. And so we have some different fun photos. Jean, would you like to come and share more about it? Uh, do you want me over there? Oh, okay. Yeah, so that everyone can see you. Well, the man on the left is Patterson Yahtzee. He is now the manager of the entire um, uh, uh, development there. Uh, uh, he is the manager of the site, the site operation. So he oversees the school as well as he oversees the actual mission thing. About a few um, month or two ago, they have a newsletter that comes out and he had a wish list in there of things that they needed. And so as we travel down um, to Arizona this winter in February, along the way, we picked up donations from people <laughs> that were responding to the wish list. Um, uh, there were several from the congregation, but also people down there. Uh, we stopped with a lady at Prescott Valley, and she had several of the things, a, a coffee, a, a food processor, processor, and a couple things, and we picked up some toasters and other things. And so by the time we got there, we had, um, and other people had sent it down, because with Amazon, they deliver to the Navajo, even though it's way in the middle of nowhere. Um, but so you can order on Amazon and have it delivered there in terms of if you see anybody on, on anything else on the wish list. 
uh, what what we wanted to do was to show you the results of what we had done in um, the, the upper picture on the left hand side. One of the things we did when we went down in 2020 was to to convert and renovate an apartment to make it ADA compliant. You can see there's a shower to the right. There's a stool, one that we put in, they put in a new floor, new stool, which is up to 17 inches higher. And then to the right is the, is the shower. You'll see it down at the bottom. This is a shower where you can roll a wheelchair right up to it. And actually uh, they put a chair inside, the person can uh, then have shower, et cetera. Um, down at the bottom, we didn't do this, but after we left, there was money uh, that was left to do a ramp. So in this, this is the room, the uh, apartment which we worked on. So now people with wheelchairs can roll up on this side, and this is the kind of ramp. And we didn't know what it was going to look like. We thought it was going to be wood or cement, but they did it with metal so that it it doesn't uh, collect the water. Um, and then up at the top, uh, we also had heard about they had the need for water. Uh, they had dug a new well. This the well itself totally about about $200,000 to actually dig this deep well. And they put it in uh, with, you see the larger tank, but you also see this is what happens every day is somebody uh, with a pickup and a trailer shows up with a, a large tank. Marv, what is about, how many gallons is that tank? I think it's 17,000. That's the big one. I want the one in the, in the pickup. Uh, that looks like it's gonna be what, 250. Okay, gallons? Yeah. Okay. And what they've got is a card system. So they go into the office of the mission house, they have a credit card, and they put money on the credit card, which gives them how much water they can get. So then they, then they take the card out to that little where it says where it's white, they're on the other side of the vehicle, and they stick their card in, and they punch in the numbers as to how many gallons they can, they've paid for how many gallons they can get. And then it just so it's all a, it's all a prepay system, Marv. Now they have to pay two cents a gallon for water. Why do they have to pay that? Um, they paid two cents a gallon for water. Okay, um, Marv is reminding me. They paid two cents a gallon for water. Why? Because the chapter also has a well in the same village in Rock Point, and that's what they charge. So they have to charge an equal amount. Otherwise, the Navajo they don't understand free in that regard. So if they pay two thousand two. You know, two cents per gallon. That's what the chapter is charging. That's what um, they charge. Did I say it right? Yeah, okay. exactly. Okay. But it wasn't their idea. No, it wasn't their idea. They did not want to charge people for water, you know. Um, but they found out they really had to to, to be commensurate. Um, the other thing that we did was to tear down a wall in what we mentioned that. Okay. Um, the other thing was we cleaned out. Um, maybe Pastor Lara would appreciate this. If you walk into a church that hasn't been had a sacristy or a storage rooms cleaned out for 40 years. So um, Kate decided that Marv and I knew how to sort and throw. So we went in and sorted old banners where the where the, the felt was coming off because the glue was so brittle. Um, and so we could do that and they could blame it on us and then leave. See, so we just simply threw things out like crazy. That's a very important job. Very important job which we did was to sort and throw. And so uh, we, we really did. We just, uh, it's amazing the, the stuff that people will send. We, in missionary fields, when we were in Tanzania, we'd call it Jesus junk. They would, people would ship out stuff and think that we could use, like use tea bags and things. It, it doesn't work. Uh, I mean, we, and it just, you know, if it doesn't work in the States, please don't send it out to someplace because it won't work there either. All right, go ahead, another one. I think that's me. I'm done. Oh, uh, no, I'm not done. Um, what the new thing that they, we started, they, they started during this pandemic, they realized a need for food distribution. So they took a maintenance shed up on the left hand corner. And the maintenance shed is one that they converted into a food bank. So in the food bank, um, it's run in conjunction with an organization called St. Mary's, St. Mary's Food Banks. All right. So down below, you see two big, huge walk-in coolers. And then this is one of the walk-in coolers. And then there's a guy named Raphael. And then what he does is he makes up these boxes for food, et cetera. So people can come. He's got an office. He has a checklist. So anybody who has applied for food bank uh, property or food bank uh, distribution, he checks it off every time they come and get a box. And so that this is now the food operation that's happening. 
And it, it was really amazing to how much food, the, the, the thousands and thousands of pounds of food that they distribute every week. Perfect. And so Jean alluded to this when she was talking about the price of the water, uh, but this land is leased. So it's they still have to operate with the uh, Navajo Nation um, and make sure that they are following all the different regulations uh, that uh, they have asked of them to do uh, while they're on that property. So when we are, we do want to go back down because it's an amazing experience. Not only is the land beautiful, uh, like the red cult, the red earth that you see, gorgeous sunsets. Um, we also didn't get a taste of the full picture. So we went down in March. It was cold. Uh, and now we're going to switch it up. So we have an opportunity to join Magnolia Lutheran Church uh, to go on a trip together from June 30th to July 7th. Um, so I shared with my good pal, Lyle Morris, uh, the fact that we did go on this trip uh, right before the pandemic. And he was fascinated because of hearing in the news the impact that the um, pandemic was having on the Navajo Nation. And he's like, what can I do to help? And I was like, well, let me talk, to, introduce you to Pastor Kate. And he just kept on going, you know? And so this is uh, out of the fruition of, of some mission that he would like to help support from Magnolia Lutheran. And he'll have the opportunity to share a little bit more about what has happened. But when we're down there, anyone can come. We can find projects to do while we're down there. And if you come to stay, it's just $20 per person and then supporting some community feeding that we'll do together as a group, opportunity to eat and dine because um, we have access to full kitchens. And then the different projects that we have are determined on the number of volunteers that are available. So the office is hesitant to give us projects until they know how many people are going to be down there at that time. Some projects could be supporting the community meal program, sorting and cleaning, because as Jean said, there's opportunities for that at any point during the day. And um, other uh, work can be done on their maintenance shed. I think they said they needed a new roof for the church as well. So there's lots of opportunities for projects, big and small. I mentioned one thing, uh, which is uh, when we were down there before, uh, Michelle spent a lot of her time making curtains and, and didn't, uh, she sat at a machine and made curtains because a lot of the places in, and uh, need curtains made because the dry, the kind of weather disintegrates a lot of cloth stuff. So, I mean, there is just a lot of different kinds of activities. You're not just simply building stuff or tearing it down. But now I'd like to introduce my pal, Lyle Morris, to come talk about the solar generator project that we um, would like to support while we're down there. Morning. Uh, I'm uh, Lyle Morris from Magnolia Lutheran. I'm Marvin Jean, uh, we've met uh, in uh, Tanzania, I think it's where, where we met. As Becca said, we have a couple of projects that we picked out. She mentioned that 35% of the uh, reservation is without running water. Uh, if you threw in how many were without electricity also, it's almost 50% of the reservation is without either running water, electricity, or both. Um, on the, on the, that, so the, the remoteness of the area, most of the generators that are running there are gasoline. We took the opportunity to, with the new development of electric cars and the development around the, uh, uh, the change in, in battery storage and such. We have found a, a product uh, from uh, uh, Blue Eddy, which provides about 2000 watts of, uh, of power. Uh, we brought in a, a demonstration unit at Magnolia, set it up and started seeing how many panels and so on were needed. Now, obviously, the, the, one of the things that they have that's free is sunshine. And uh, during the day, the, the solar generators can uh, be recharged to be able to run at night. While it can't heat a house, it can run an electric blanket. It's, it has a capacity to uh, uh, run in a, a refrigerator. So if you're starting medications or fresh foods or something of this, this nature, possible to uh, run that through the night and even recharge it during the day off of maybe a more traditional source. The Blue Eddy uh, is the, what you're seeing there on the right are the, the people from the maintenance staff 
we went down last August and took our, our demonstration unit from Magnolia, set up four panels, which is the uh, maximum amount of input, that's about 180 watt a panel, and so it's the maximum that, that generator can take. Uh, showed them how to, how to do the looping and the direct wire current, uh, 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 direct current wiring, and uh, the uh, set up the generator in one the eight sided building. Ho Hosan, uh, Hoa, uh, so that that could be. Yep. Okay, now you see the solar power runs a generator. Now you're just talking about a battery bank, right? It's a battery. it's a solar charged generator that is that whose in, the interior of that is a lithium battery, okay, lithium battery. like a like a Tesla. How does it how does the generator function? How does that run? I mean, I'm it runs on electricity. The generator runs on electricity. From from uh, it, the so battery is charged by the solar panels, right. and then it puts off through a, a, a it has a converter, so you can run AC uh, through the inverter. You can run DC. Uh, if you were having a DC refrigerator or anything of that nature. Uh, we, we also provide with the kit a small LED light that draws about an amp off of, the, off of that stored en energy so that you can get to your medications at night and that sort of thing. Uh, the solar kit, which is uh, uh, our goal this year is five to raise $14,285 for five of the household kits, includes a generator, four panels, the cabling for connecting, uh, the Ys for distribution for going into the building, and then uh, uh, a solar light, uh, LED light. The generator is always kept inside, by the way, since it's battery, it doesn't exhaust, and there's no, no, uh, uh, no noise, uh, and you, you have to protect it. The outside element is, is the, the panel. The other thing we're doing is uh, sponsoring four individual students, and th th they talked about the uh, school and how it's been growing. I want to point out it's not a boarding school anymore uh, uh, because half of their, their, their students don't have electricity or running water. Uh, one of the things that it provides is showers and hygiene in the morning. So a sponsorship uh, provides the funds to take a, have a truck drive to their home, pick up that child and bring them to the uh, school for, during, during the, uh, uh, for, their, for their instruction a period for hygiene in the morning. So the sponsorships provides shampoo, soap, toothbrush, uh, towels, uh, fuel for the cars to go pick them up. And then they are taken, taken home uh, in, the, in the afternoon. If there is no school, they drive to the home and deliver the breakfast and lunch that is provided for them while they're at school. There's a small cafe where they turn out 300 meals a day, something like that, I believe, for that, that, uh, uh, at, at, on a donation basis. Pay what you pay what you can. Uh, so a sponsorship for an individual student is a thousand dollars, and a sponsorship for a class is three thousand dollars. We're sponsored. We sponsored the kindergarten class last year, and this year are doing uh, the first grade, which is the kindergarten class. If they all matric matriculate, right? <laughs> if they all pass on up through, and we're going to well, it'll be a, a second grade next year, which was the 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 span of the kids that they were doing ten individuals in in uh, that class and four individuals. So a, a class scholarship is three, four for four individuals. So there's $7,000 we're trying to raise for the scholarships. And then we're going to go down uh, uh, from June 30th to July 7th. Uh, our, our group at, at Magnolia includes uh, my wife and I. Uh, uh, our pastor is going to be able to join from the second, I think, to the 30th. Uh, we have a, a retired doctor who's uh, uh, on our schedule, so maybe we can do something in relationship with the clinic. And then it's it's over the 4th of July, so we also want to be able to do something where we uh, 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 just uh, see how it's celebrated in, in uh, their way in their country. Are, am I out of the, Okay. I hate to see when you're sneaking around. You know. So is, are there any questions about... Uh, uh, Yep. They're, they're on a, a rock point where where this uh, where this facility is is about fifty miles from any other uh, uh, supplies. Uh, Jean, maybe you would. Yeah. Yeah, there is a, a public education um, Bureau of Indi Affairs has a school over in Rock Point. 
the, the change is the fact that these students that are e elected or selected to come, um, they cannot afford the bail. Sorry, I'm sorry. I need to get out of here. Over here, they the students who are selected to be there at the at the academy uh, there are students that wanted this is a faith-based operation so that a faith-based approach to the curriculum as well as the care etc and these are students who can't afford to be across at the public education place because they also even if it's public education <laughs> unfortunately they all charge fees for basic uh, supplies and everything else that's there. And these are students that also cannot afford to, uh, parents cannot afford to send them in that. There is a, this, well, I was talking about, there's a bus and they go, the limit is 13 miles out where they will pick up people. So um, anybody within that um, um, span is somebody that they can actually, where they can actually get to the bus, uh, the people. Um, the, yes, there is public education. It's just not always accessible to some of the poorest. And the routes that the bus goes to help these children, it's not like a nice road. So as like the access point is really difficult for children to get to the schools, even if they could possibly afford the resources, trying to get to that location is difficult. So that's why uh, the Nelm campus is so helpful. Uh, it's it's a for an, uh, a school year, but they continue the delivery of uh, food, for example, when the school isn't open. Also, uh, this class sponsorship uh, then includes uh, uh, supplies for that class. There's ten. There were ten kindergartners. I think the, the class size last year ended up at 39. Now they're talking about maybe 50 as they as they keep entering new students at the kindergarten level. On so at any rate, we have uh, uh, two projects that we were working on. Uh, also, the very important thing about the uh, generators, by the way, is the charging of uh, cell phones and devices and so on uh, uh, to, to be able to uh, do that overnight uh, without a, a generator running or something of that nature. So if you would want to join us uh, uh, that June 30th to July 7th, you're on your own. <laughs> I suppose you contact Becca. Uh, if you want to participate in uh, uh, helping with the scholarship, sponsorships, excuse me, sponsorships, and so on, uh, 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 make your check out to, to St. Andrews and Neelam, Navajo Evangelical Lutheran Mission. With, with the Navajo Mission on the memo line. Yeah, Neelam on the mem memo line, and uh, uh, any, anything helps, obviously. We've had uh, gifts of a dollar to a gift of $10,000. So, uh, and ours. <clears throat> if you want more uh, information about our 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 efforts and a white sheet on the on the uh, generator that has the individual pricing and also uh, on the sponsorships uh, and our trip, there's there's some of these scattered around. I think I did ten of them. And there's a couple up here. You can take that and read them. And with that, thank you. Glorious. Any other questions? Yeah, they go on to a high school. The high school actually across the street at Rock Point is quite good. Um, and they can transfer directly over. And there's no intent to go anything beyond that preparatory. This is this is the students that they select and bring in are some are that have the poorest chance to succeed in the middle of a larger class. Um, we were there, we got invited to quote a tea with the preschoolers. And so we're sitting there. If you can imagine Marvin sitting at a table with preschoolers, it was pretty, pretty funny. Um, but um, they wanted to learn about how to do a, a tea, how to have some conversation. So we asked them questions about their home and about their family. And these truly are some of the poorest of the poor. They're also oftentimes members um, uh, of the families that attend House of Prayer Lutheran Church. Obviously, if they're in a, a, a Christian faith uh, circle, um, <clears throat> they're going to want to continue their kids in the same way um, with that. But it's an application process. They're not discriminated against at all. It's just those who do apply and what they look for in that regard. They just check to make sure that this is a good use of sponsors' money. Very similar to the same kind of thing what OBA does with Maasai girls. 
they, they check out who, who gets it and who doesn't. Uh, I think one of the things that, that, that we noticed when we were there was, uh, uh, I guess we're there because we're Christian, not because uh, we're trying to make them, them Christian per se. Uh, and we certainly uh, uh, saw an evidence of uh, spirituality that, was, that, 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 that tries to be uh, maintained and supported in, in relationship with the Navajo and their, their beliefs. So the, the eight-sided building, the, the way that you enter and that you walk, that you're, the seating is done in a certain manner and uh, the, the uh, uh, structures that, uh, the, like the, the sweat uh, lodges and so on. And, and it, it was, the, their culture, instead of wiping out that from the from the uh, experience and from the teaching, it's it's uh, it's included. But uh, I'm I'm certainly not. Uh, I I I don't know. I know Yazi is, for example, is uh, uh, having instruction, as Jean said, uh, and uh, there is a a, a a clear presence of uh, of our church there with with the mission, uh, and I think that's that's the essence that. That we go where we're where we're called, and we're called to uh, feed, clothe, and and uh, help people that have uh, fewer resources than us. And that's that's the that's the mission I see. Let me just add on that they they don't have a, a difficulty to know they, uh, they it's approached from the great spirit in the sense of a creator god. They have no difficulty, and to simply say that the creator spirit, the the big spirit, the great spirit came down in incarnate is a, not a difficult concept for them to understand because of the the love of the great spirit that would want to come and be flesh with them and to live with them, to dwell with them, the idea of incarnation. Um, and by our presence there, we represent that piece of our theology to say we, we've come to be with you. And so it's not to deny anything, it's to enflesh it or to, to, um, to fill it out, to actually to take it further, in other words as Jesus being the ultimate revelation of God, but it doesn't deny the revelation of God in creation or in other different forms, et cetera. When Jean goes down, uh, she actually helps lead some different adult education as well. And uh, some of the conversation is revolving around that, like with the partnership and collaboration between the different faiths. Um, and so Jean's great advocate for the voice of talking about being with instead of two distinct ideas. But yes, thank you so much for listening today. We appreciate uh, you taking time to learn a little bit more about uh, the campus itself, as well as our mission that we'd like to go down. And we'd love to have you in any way, shape, or form. Uh, we're happy to have your support as we think about future endeavors as well with the Navajo Evangelical Lutheran Mission. Thank you all. <laughs>